Welcome to HEC TV Presents, a tribute to our nation's veterans. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Gore, and I'm very happy to welcome you to Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery for our special program in tribute to America's veterans. In this program, we'll learn about five individual Americans who served their country in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the two wars in Iraq and the Persian Gulf. We'll also learn about the history and beauty of this majestic cemetery which serves our veterans. Currently, well over 100,000 veterans are buried at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. Veterans Day, of course, occurs November 11th of every year, designated a national holiday when President Eisenhower signed the legislation in 1954 to commemorate one day to make sure we celebrate the veterans and the services they provided our country. Behind me, the Mississippi River. We'll start our tour by going to that spot where the Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery began over 180 years ago. being joined by Al Cochran, Program Support Assistance for Jefferson National Barracks. Thanks hey very much, Al, for being here. Thanks for inviting me. So we're in the oldest section of the cemetery. Fort Jefferson Barracks was actually founded in 1826, correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Fort Bellefontaine, which was the original fort west of the Mississippi River, had what, correct. just been out, it was no longer a viable location, so we moved That's here true. instead? So they moved here instead, yes. Sir. And this ground that we're standing on was the cemetery for Jefferson Barracks originally? Yes, sir. Yes. And I notice we're right next to the first gravestone, grave site in the cemetery. This is Eliza Ann Lash. She was the daughter of a, of uh, a soldier here on site? That, that, was, that was stationed here at this site. She died from cholera. I also notice, Al, that in the Civil War section there are a lot of unknowns. Um, obviously, there was not DNA evidence at the time. I True. mean, how uh, go through the process of like what makes someone an unknown soldier in the Civil War? Well, actually, the unknown soldiers during the uh, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, what they did was is they went along the riversides and behind churches, behind home, and uh, Abraham Lincoln had them disinterred. One of his orders was to uh, bring them all to one central location. Of course, again, the, we didn't have the uh, the DNA testing like we do now, so that we do know that they were were soldiers of the war. So they brought them back to one central location and they uh, gave them the proper burial and uh, just on the top of their headstone it will say unknown, but we do know that they did serve. So President Lincoln designated this as a location to bring those Civil War soldiers unknown Not to Not only buried. this location, but all locations. He had no idea that it was going to be this large, but he just wanted all soldiers to be interred in one central location. And that's where your National Cemetery started. And I noticed in this section where we've talked about the Civil War, we've got Confederate soldiers buried here. Jefferson Barracks was actually a, a, a prisoner of war camp, correct, yes, during the Civil correct. War? And mm -hmm. is that why Confederate soldiers are buried that here? That's exactly the reason why the uh, Confederate soldiers are buried here. So the only Confederate soldiers that would be buried in national cemeteries would have been buried there because they died as prisoners of war? Yes, sir. sir. What was the purpose of the pointed headstone? Actually, the purpose of the pointed headstones were that during the uh, Civil War, the Union soldiers were used to walk through the uh, Confederate cemetery. They would stop and take a break. They would sit on their headstones, smoke, chew tobacco, whatever. And to stop that, the Confederate decided that they would make their headstones pointed so that Union soldiers couldn't stop and sit on their headstones. Ah. So, and that's the, the difference between the roundness on the headstone and the pointed on the headstone for the Confederate soldiers. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Al, we've arrived in a section of the, of the cemetery which is predominantly World War II veterans. I notice mm -hmm. here we're standing by Jack Buck's yes. um, gravestone. He was a corporal in World War II and had a Purple Heart, I see, and he's yes, just he one of hundreds of World right. War II veterans who are correct. buried here. Now, originally, this was actually land that was a boot camp for people yes, working, serving in World War II? for World War II veterans. And as you can see, to my right, you see the old Calvary Horse Stable, which is a green building right here, and then right further to my right is the uh, living quarters where they used to uh, house the, uh, the World War II veterans. Uh, so it was uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting as far as, you know, as far as the land and, and, and also below the bottom of the hill, we have the railroad tracks, you know, that transported troops and also they used the uh, Mississippi River to transport supplies and equipment for the veterans. Now in terms of uh, location, what made this a predominantly World War II veteran area? Was that just the way the 
the cemetery grew, so to speak, or this land was available at that well, time? Well, as the space was needed, uh, they interred the World War II veterans. As we continued to move farther back into the cemetery, then we started mixing in other veterans, you know, because of the space availability that we had here in the cemetery. As you would notice just right here, the Madame Lee is World War II veterans, but of course we see Jack Bucks that's planted here in this section because of the space availability. Now, one of the unique features of this particular section are the mass graves that we have here. I understand yes, there's well over 500 mass burial sites yes, here. Yes, sir, about 530 mass graves that are located here in Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. And so as we go into this area, these are all mass graves for people who served during World War II, died actually in the World War II time period? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, also uh, the mass graves were, again, when the... Uh, like when you board an airplane, they have a roster of the personnel. So they knew who was on that aircraft or on that ship or whatever, and then they brought them in and, and turned them into the, uh, into the site. So we knew who was on the, the airplane, so to speak, but we couldn't identify each individual person then, as, and that's why they're in a, a, a mass burial site. Another example of a mass burial I see here are these victims of a Japanese massacre. What can you tell us about the situation surrounding this grave site? Uh, yes, the uh, Japanese had the American prisoners building an airfield uh, for their uh, landing purposes and uh, they found out that there were potential invasion that was going to happen so what they did was they had three tunnels and they uh, rushed the American prisoners into each tunnel, doused them with diesel gasoline and uh, set them on fire with torches. Those that were trying to escape what they did was they set them on fire and also those that were trying to escape they shut them down with machine gun fire. Harrison Oates, United States Coast Guard from the 27th day of December 1941 until May the 15th, 1945. Harrison, I noticed that your dates of service coincide quite closely, obviously, to, with, to the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Was it the event of Pearl Harbor that inspired you, caused you to join the, the military? It definitely was. What was, the, what was it like in the country at that point in time? Take us into the, the sense of what the country felt like, what the fear or anxiety was, and how you com were committed to serving at that point. Well, my older brother was in the ROTC, in the Army. And uh, I knew a little bit about it, him and so forth. And I decided that it was time to go, that uh, I was a senior in high school. And so I interrupted my uh, education by six, by six months. I decided to go then. And you decided to join the Coast Guard? That was your first choice? No, I tried to join the Navy and all they had was uh, six year enlistments. They had fours and they run out of them. And I knew everything. <laughs> and I decided that uh, four, uh, eight, six years are too much. I wanted to go to sea. So he took me out in the hall and pointed up the hall. He said, the Coast Guard is sending me to sea. And they sure did. <laughs> Basically, uh, after I got in the Coast Guard, I, like I say, I went to uh, Norfolk and then boarded a ship there in my civilian clothes. And uh, our first uh, thing was to patrol Cape Hatteras. I figured we'd go to boot camp, but it never happened. My boot camp was rolling depth charges on U-boats. We would roll them, they were set like a clock. They had a dial on them. You set them by the footage. And it's a guess at that time, our equipment wasn't that good. They would take and set that and at a certain depth they would explode. And the barrage usually was probably about eight depth charges. My job was look out, uh, work on the after gun crew on the stern, and then sometimes I would work, help with the depth charges, reloading them and so forth. In that period of time, 5,000 men died. In other words, about four and a half months, 365 ships went down with over 5,000 men. What was the spirit of the country like during this World War II period? Uh, it was very patriotic. Uh, I don't think we'll ever see it again. And what does it mean to you that we take the time at least once a year, if not more often, to honor America's veterans? What would you want the public to know about the importance of honoring veterans? Well, uh, as the uh, honor flight has the back of our shirts, it says, uh, you learn English from your teacher, and thank a veteran you're speaking English. <laughs> Al, as we stand here by the, the gravesite of J.B. Underwood, a staff sergeant who I see was in the armed services from World War II all the way through Vietnam, mm -hmm. and we look at over this large expanse, 
We've now arrived at the area of the cemetery where we've really got people from all wars buried, correct? We've started correct. at the original section. We went to a Civil War area. We went to a World War II area. But now, of course, as more and more veterans get buried, um, there's just all sorts of space you have to fill. Talk a little bit about the scope of the operation here, because we're obviously getting a lot of World War II and Korean veterans dying. How, what, how many burials do you all have to deal with? Well, on an average uh, here at Jefferson Barracks, during the summertime, we have about, um, I want to say, 20 uh, burials a day. And as it gets into the colder months during the wintertime, it's up to 45 burials a day. Uh, what we see here is through this large, vast area is that when we have space available, we'll inter the veterans throughout the cemetery. So it doesn't matter what time period you served, but it's when you pass. And again, we look at the headstone here and we see that this gentleman right here served in three different wars. He was in during that time period and therefore he has the three different war time periods on his headstone. So you're averaging, generally speaking, 450 to 500 burials a month here at Jefferson yes, Barracks sir. alone? Alone. And, and how many national cemeteries are there? We have about 139 national cemeteries. Now, you also served in the military yourself. You're a Marine, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. And you're constantly giving back, and as we take time to think in terms of commemorating veterans, how would you like the public to think about veterans, and how should they think about honoring them? What's the best way they could do that? Well, um, being a minister myself, the best way to honor anything is to have respect. And in order to get respect, you have to receive, you have to give respect. And so when we see that these veterans are coming back now and that are looking for someone to hold them in, to bring them in, to have an outreach program so that we can let them know that we really appreciate what they've done for our country. Because today it's them, tomorrow it may be you. My fellow citizens, at noon today, I sent a message to the Congress about the situation in Korea. We have sent land, sea, and air forces to assist in these operations. We have done this because we know that what is at stake here is nothing less than our national security and the peace of the world. Claire Feller, my niece. I was in the Marine Corps during the Korean conflict, Sergeant, 1950 to 1952 on active duty as a reserve. Claire is an active duty reservist, a female active duty <laughs> reservist in the Korean conflict. I would assume that makes you fairly unique? Uh, yes, sir, it does. There weren't too many of us who went from the reserves into the, uh, uh, into, onto active duty. The Marine Corps just had a, a special little something and the reserve happened to open and uh, I was available and so were they, so it worked out real well. <laughs> it was as close as we could get to the male reservist time. We did have meetings once a week in the evening at that time. Now I think they have it over a week and a month. But uh, uh, when the, uh, we'd had the drill, we had the uh, the classes, and we learned to salute. <laughs> learned not to fall over each other when we marched. <laughs> and uh, uh, once uh, in uh, June, when the men went off to camp, they opened the reserve uh, uh, buildings for us, and uh, we reported every day for two weeks for active duty for training. And uh, at the end of that, we were supposed to have had all of the boot camp that we would get. In fact, it was all the boot camp we would get. In July, when the Korean War started, everybody, well, we were Marines. They, uh, there were waves, there were WACs, there were WAFs, but there were women Marines. And uh, so when they were put on standby, we were put on standby. It shocked a lot of us. <laughs> but uh, a lot of us really wanted to serve, so we did our duty. Instead of the train coming to the reserve center, the women went to the uh, Union Station, and there was a uh, separate Pullman car waiting for us. Uh, the colonel in charge of reservists was there to see us off. Our parents could come, and uh, we were locked in a Pullman car. <laughs> you were locked in a Pullman car? We were car. locked in a Pullman car. It had 24 berths. There were 23 of us who uh, were uh, eligible to serve. And uh, we would march through the other 
cars to the diner and back, but, uh, we, and we were put behind the baggage car so that the door could be locked and no one came through our car. It was, I think, not so much for our protection or for the protection of everyone else, but to keep us as a unit. Uh, we left on Friday night and got into San Francisco, actually Oakland, on uh, Monday morning. They had to scramble to get the women enough uniforms so that we could each have a uniform to arrive in San Francisco. We left St. Louis in our summer uniforms. We had to pack our winter uniforms and our night clothes and our, uh, our dungarees, as they used to call them, for on the train and no civilian clothes because they did not know at the time what we were going to face. All they could tell us was take as much money as you can. We don't know when you're going to get paid. Uh, we'll, uh, when we, by the time you get there, we'll know what to do with you. So they put us in a hotel and then uh, had us find our own subs, our own quarters and uh, pay the subs. So uh, it was almost like a, a civilian job, except we knew different. The Marines protected us. We were their sisters. And uh, the uh, other services, they knew better than to, uh, uh, to overstep their art, so it seemed. And uh, the civilians were kind of mixed. Uh, they weren't all nice, but they weren't outwardly uh, nasty to us. They uh, might try to ignore us or whatever. But mostly it was, uh, it was positive, especially in San Francisco. What would you like the public to know about honoring veterans? I want them to be remembered. I want them to be respected. I want them uh, to get, uh, uh, especially the ones who need the help, I want them to get the help they need to fit back into, either go back into service if uh, that's what uh, they were going to do, or to fit in uh, to the civilian life. I know that the cemetery is always concerned with space, they're yes, continually sir. expanding, and we've arrived in an area where we see a lot of construction going on. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what's happening here. On the other side of this wall is the hospital has donated another 30 acres for Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery, seeing that we are running out of space. And so what they're building right here is they're putting uh, uh, crypts in this spot, 5,500 uh, concrete government liners that will be going in this spot right here. And that's because for the space availability, and then on the other side of the wall right here, we have the columbariums, where the cremains will be on top of the ground because we normally bury in ground. So now we'll be putting them in, in a uh, concrete wall with the, uh, for the uh, crypts. We're talking about a huge location here, over 180,000 people buried in the entire cemetery. Describe for us the maintenance operation that goes on here for the cemetery. Well, as you can see right now, the maintenance is, is uh, pretty uh, perpetual. We have guys that come out on a daily basis to check to make sure that the headstones are clean, to make sure that the headstones are in line, to uh, make sure that the grounds are clean. So when the family members come out, that they can come out and enjoy the serene surrounding of the cemetery when they're spending time with their loved ones. Uh, we also have a grass cutting crew that comes out and pretty much cut the grass every week. By the time they get through at one section, they're working on another section. So throughout the whole week, they're just doing a turnaround for the whole cemetery. We have over 180,000 headstones and they uh, actually weed whack every headstone when they come out to do the maintenance. So as you can see right now, uh, the grounds are looking pretty good. My fellow Americans, as President and Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. Michael Moore in Vietnam. I made three tours there between 66 and 72. And I went into the reserves and I served until 
2002 where I retired as an 04. Why did you choose to go into the military? Uh, I can remember as a kid my uncle coming home in his Navy uniform and that's all I ever wanted to do was to join and uh, wear Cracker Jacks. <laughs> so you chose to enlist? Yes. Two weeks after I graduated high school I went to uh, Great Lakes where we had 13 weeks of basic training and uh, upon graduation there I was assigned to fire control technician gun school. I did an A and C school and two years later I was in the fleet. Uh, that was in uh, January of 68. Picked a ship up in uh, Subic Bay and headed straight for Vietnam. We was uh, over there, that cruise was seven months long. The Tet Offensive of 68, we got hit. Took about three shells in the after stack. Uh, Captain's gig was wiped out. Hits on the ASROC launcher. Signal Shack was uh, hit, which I was right above that. I was a gun director as a tracker. We had shrapnel marks on the side of the gun director. So we had a lot of shrapnel flying everywhere. Uh, one guy did get injured on the ship. He was not killed, but he was injured. And uh, we had a couple other guys that was up behind slip rings in a barbette of a missile launcher. Uh, they had a little trouble getting them out because they was hanging on. Your adrenaline just goes from nothing to max. And, you know, rather than talking normal over the phones, everybody was screaming. Uh, there wasn't that many ships that really come under fire over there. As soon as we got hit, we turned and went to sea and uh, ordered to see what our damage was. Mm -hmm. But the Tet Offensive was several days, uh, which the ground crews that were in Vietnam had a lot more to do with it. But we were out there for support fire. When they'd call and say, you know, give us 20 rounds at this location, we was able to drop 20 rounds in there. When you returned from service, you went into the reserves, but what was your experience like coming back from the war? I was very dissatisfied coming back uh, because over the four years and the three tours I did in Nam, uh, it got to where we was not allowed to wear our uniforms ashore and stuff like that because of demonstrators and things. Uh, that's one reason why I got out of the active service. Honoring veterans, I, I believe, really should be uh, something that is preached in schools uh, because without the veterans, there's many rights we would not have. Uh, and uh, today, you know, the veterans are over trying to get those rights for other people too. And that's what we were doing in Vietnam. And I, I still believe that's what we were there for. It, you know, fighting communism and trying to keep people free. Uh, and that's the biggest thing a vet does for you. And uh, not to respect that is, I, I don't know, it's uh, one of the great sins in my book. Now we've arrived at a relatively new section of the cemetery, right? Mm -hmm. This section's just a couple of years old? Yes, sir, that is correct. As you continue to expand off in that direction, you'll continue to expand in that direction um, in the next few years. But I noticed as we move into this area, and I, I saw it in other places as well, there are different emblems of belief that are placed on the gravestones. That is correct. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, basically what we do here at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery is we feel that every belief of the individual should be respected no matter what it is. So what we do is we put the emblem on the top, emblem of belief, to honor those veterans' wishes as far as their belief uh, for their higher power. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. This conflict started August 2nd when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Corporal Dennis Thomas McCall is United States Marine Corps, Golf Company 27, 1990-94. I, I come from a, a long line of veterans in my family. It was something that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, so 
At 17, my mom and dad signed for me. Three days after I graduated high school, I left for Marine Corps boot camp. Graduated from there and uh, went through combat training and infantry school after that. And almost six months to the day, I ended up in, uh, at the time, was Operation Desert Shield. And then uh, it was about three weeks before the air war started is when I arrived in country. I was in the infantry. I was a, a ground fighter. That's what we did. We were, were the first, you know, the first to fight, as they always say, the first ones in, the last ones to leave. We got there. They sent us out to our units. You know, and within just a matter of days, the air war started. Then the night that the air war started, we'd actually come off patrol. We were running patrols, and we got back into the hooches there, and uh, everybody. We could hear a lot of commotion. The sirens started going off and things like that. And I remember that night walking outside and you could see the, the planes and all the fireworks going off, you know, and that, that's when the actual war started. So I was only in country a few days and uh, everything kind of kicked off at that point. Once the air war started, we, we got rid of the tents and I lived in a hole in the ground. We would uh, move at night, dig skirmisher trenches and we'd stay down in those holes at night. And uh, for about three months, I lived in a hole, uh, showered, Every 30 days, whether I needed it or not, you know, that was uh, what we did. And when I say a shower, it was, they would bring a truck out with a big, what they call a water bowl on the back of it. And it would shoot a little stream of water out and you would strip off in your hole and you'd run out in the middle of the desert and they'd squirt you down with water and you'd come back in. You know, you'd, uh, living wise, same t-shirt for about three months. Uh, you got a new pair of socks about once a week, they come out and throw you new socks so your feet wouldn't be too bad. So it was, uh, you know, they drive by, throw food out in the holes for you. So it was, it was quite the experience. The first night that the Scud missiles hit, you know, I, we still had the tents at the time, and I was in my sleeping bag, had the buttons and the zipper up, and sometime during my sleeping, the, the sleeping bag had rolled to the, where the buttons were behind me. We hear the air raid siren go off, we we're gonna take incoming fire, and we had to get out, we had trenches built outside that we could go out and take cover in. Well, when I went to open my sleeping bag, I couldn't get out. All I got was cloth. And so I ended up, it looked like it was snowing by the time I got out of there because I had destroyed the sleeping bag. You know, the, all the stuffing was flying through the air and everything. Everybody got a pretty good kick out of the fact that the, the new boot that had just got to the platoon had destroyed his sleeping bag about two weeks after he got there. You know, then it got where it was almost a nightly occurrence that you're taking that. And, you know, then once we got out into the holes and we start moving it closer to Kuwait, you know, we would take mortar fire almost on a daily basis, and it, uh, it it's strange because you get almost used to the sound of those coming in. It's never a, you're never comfortable, and you know, I don't want to make a mistake there, but it's, it becomes a part of your everyday life, it seems like. And you were part of the first group that actually crossed into Kuwait and began the process of going into the, into the country there. Describe for us what it was like to meet resistance. Did you meet much resistance? What was the battle like? The night that the, the ground war started, uh, we were dug in in holes inside of a berm that was actually right on the Kuwait border. And they had, was gonna do a lot, they came in, they started popping holes in the, the berm wall where we were gonna go through at. And they were gonna do kind of a last ditch effort here in the States to try to avoid the ground war, to see if he would surrender at that time. And I remember that night down in a, because the holes were stretched as far as you could see either way. That was actually the front line. So if you was in your hole, you were in friendly territory. If you stepped in front of it, you're in enemy territory. And the night that the, the ground war actually started, you could hear it. it. It was almost like a roar because you could hear the guys, you know, the deep breaths and the, the excitement and everything that was going on that it, that it was on, that we were actually going in. And so when we got the word, get on your gear, it's time to go. Uh, they loaded us up in trucks, and I was actually in the second five-ton truck that went through the border inside country. Uh, our first mission when we got in there was the breaching of the minefield. You know, Saddam was known for all of his, his booby traps and his mines that he had laid out across the desert. And uh, we, we pulled up, and just as far as you could see on top of the sand was, uh, was these mines. And you know, we come through and blast a strip down the middle, and we move out and we start crossing the minefield. Uh, I remember I had an AT4, the hand grenades and all the extra rounds and stuff that you're supposed to carry. We got right in the middle of the minefield and they give us the freeze sign and take a knee. And I can remember being 18 years old, sitting there on a knee with all these explosives strapped to my back thinking this is 
probably not the best place. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, rather, I'd much rather be on the other side of this thing. And, you know, as we moved out, you know, we'd heard all these stories and the intelligence had come back. You know, we had all these troops and um, all these mechanical vehicles, all this stuff, you know. And we actually got up there and we found he had had plywood cutouts that were stuck in the ground up there. There was old cars with pipes shoved through the window so they'd look like a tank from the air and different things like that. You know, and so we moved in and we secured Iraqi positions right off the, the get-go there. And uh, this was all within the first probably 12 hours of the ground war. I mean, it was a pretty fast pace. Everything was moving, kind of chewing the desert up and going. You know, Task Force Grizzly, and so we're, we're moving forward. And that was the first firefight that I had actually been involved in. And uh, I remember when it was over, just scared, you know, like the adrenaline dump that came, you know, in the, in the shaking, you know, and I remember sitting there and this old Sergeant Major walks up to me and he says, uh, how old are you, Devil Dog? And I said, well, I'm 18, Sergeant Major. And he says, you beat me by a year. And I said, I don't understand. And he told me then, he said, I was 19 in the jungles of Vietnam the first time I was shot at. And he said, that's baptism by fire. He said, that's something you're never going to forget. And those are very true words, very true. And what was the return like for you? Coming home was just unbelievable. We, we, we flew back in, you know, once they decided when we was going to come back, and we got broke up on a few different flights. Uh, I landed in Westover in an Air Force base. And uh, when we got there, there was uh, some VFW guys from that area came up, said, hey, we got a few people inside. They think you guys are heroes. Act accordingly. It's OK. And we, a few people is what we're thinking. So we get off the plane and we walk into this hangar and they open the doors and there's a red carpet and uh, <clears throat> there's thousands of people and they're waving banners and uh, wanting you to sign stuff. They got pictures of, you know, and newspaper, newspapers they want you to sign that says the war is over and you, you make your way down this red carpet and at the end of it, you know, there's a live band playing American flags everywhere and the, the Vietnam vets are there. And uh, my dad was a Vietnam vet, and I remember thanking those guys for their service, because I know what my, my father came home to. And I, I really believe that a lot of what we enjoyed as Desert Storm veterans was our country's way of going, you know, we dropped the ball the last time. You know, we, we gotta make this right, and we'll never do this again. So, you know, I thank them, and uh, they had free beer sitting at the end of it, so, you know, they fought a war there where there was no beer, so it was nice to have a cold beer at the end of that. And I made it over, they had a set of pay phones where we could call our family. And I remember uh, <clears throat> I called my dad and I held the phone up and I said, you know, this is, this is the one you didn't get, you know, basically so he can enjoy that part of the homecoming with me. The importance and I think the best thing that can be done to honor our veterans is to remember them. Remember, you know, the sacrifice that was made by each and every person that's ever served. You know, we can walk around and, you know, we have the freedom to do the things that we want to do. And uh, that came with a price, you know, that was not free. And it's uh, the, the, the greatest honor is, I think, is to, to step back and to, you know, just remember what these people have went through and what they've done, you know, and it's, you do it for people that you'll never know but you do it, you know, not just for your family and loved ones, but it's for everybody. And just the main thing is remember them. And when you see a veteran, tell them thank you. Thank you for their service. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, Coalition forces have begun striking selective targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. David Longhibler, the first lieutenant. I served in Iraq from November 2005 to November 2006. I served in a route clearance platoon. Route clearance platoon is a, a group of trucks, specialized trucks with specialized equipment that goes on the roadsides looking for roadside bombs, IEDs is what they're what they're called. Uh, we travel the roadways, uh, anything that looks suspicious we would investigate and when it was a bomb we would get rid of it before it exploded and hurt anybody. 
many people in the audience might be familiar with the film The Hurt Locker, which talks, which shows a, a crew. Were you responsible in terms of like trying to explode IEDs to make sure they didn't kill other people? You were trying to determine whether indeed, indeed, a, it was going to uh, be a weapon that would hurt someone. We worked as a a group. Uh, I was a combat engineer officer, so my job was to actually find them. And once I discovered that it was a bomb, uh, my job was to protect the area and make sure that it was safe from anyone that would drive through. And we had uh, what they call EOD, they're explosive experts, and they're attached to us. And they have robots that would go up to the device, interrogate it, find out any information they needed off of it, and then they would blow it in place. What does that vehicle look like? It's a really big truck on wheels. I think it's the heaviest thing our military has on wheels. It's over 20 tons. And it has a hydraulic arm on it. It seats six people. And we would go up to a device uh, that we thought was an IED. And we would deploy the arm. And it's a hydraulic arm. And it had a camera on it and, and what we called the claw. And you could use that claw to manipulate the device. If it was a, a tire, flip it over, a bag of trash, you could rip into it. And then a camera, of course, uh, you would look in to see if you could find any explosives, wires, anything that would lead you to believe it was a bomb. And once you did, you got away from it fast. My platoon found 103 IEDs, and I had a, one of the best debt ratios in, in the company. It was the best. Uh, one out of 10 blew up on us before you know, we could get rid of it properly. What's that experience like? It's just somebody grabbing you and shaking you. And it's really fast, it's really loud, it's very strong, and afterwards you're kind of wondering where you're at and forget your name for a little bit. But you know, you gather yourself back together, you got a job to do, so you get back to work. What was it like to serve there? What was the camaraderie like between members of your, your platoon? It was amazing. Uh, the American people, I, I'm not sure they completely realize what they have in the American soldier. These are the bravest people I've ever seen. I, I felt safer just by having them around me. If I was there by myself, I would have been scared beyond, beyond explanation, but with them around me, I knew that I could get the job done, whatever it was. And like a lot of National Guard and, and Reserve, we got called up for service. And I found myself in Iraq uh, with uh, a bunch of other Americans who uh, are feeling the same way, like, you know, wow, what have we got ourselves into? And then, and then you just find a way to get it done. That's really what it's about. Because these are people who basically had a day job that they were always doing, right? Yes, but I, th I thought that made us uh, stronger. Because uh, you got active duty, they're, they're a younger crowd. And their, their focus and their training is more specific on military tasks. What, but I, what I found as a National Guard lieutenant is I was always being asked to do things that were outside of the box. And I had a platoon full of regular Americans who were plumbers, who were carpenters, electricians, all kinds of different um, jobs, fields, experience. And I drew on a lot of it to get, to get things done. It wasn't just the military mission. It, there was a lot of other things, too. So you returned home from war. What was the return experience like for you, and how do you think Americans are responding to veterans returning from war now? I'm very thankful because, especially the USO, when we were going through the airports, coming home, or even going to theater, they were there and they were clapping and they were cheering. They were giving us uh, food, drink. They're showing their appreciation. So you really felt like you were one of America's sons going forward. You know, you had that sense of pride. Uh, when I got home though, I had some mixed feelings because when they shipped us uh, back to where we came from, like I was on a bus, bus load of other guys and girls who came back here to Jefferson Barracks and when I got home, I have a big family. So they were there with signs and cheering, and they even got me a stretch limo. You know, I, I came home to a hero's welcome. But my family was easily half the people that were there. And there was a busload of people, a busload of soldiers. And when they got off that bus, I, I looked around, and I saw a lot of them on their cell phones looking for a ride. And it left me feeling, feeling bad because, you know, I have a strong family, so they are there for me. But I know there's a lot of people who don't have that. And they come home to silence sometimes. And they're, they're the heroes. When, when you don't get the accolades, I think that, that makes your sacrifice even stronger. What would you like people to think about as they honor veterans? In honoring veterans, if you want to honor a veteran, 
I think what you need to do is, is continuously work hard to the betterment of your country. Because there has been a long line of proud Americans that have served this country in a sacrifice, who bled, who toiled, so that what we have here is real. And if you work hard to fix the things in this country that need to be fixed, and work hard to keep this country strong, then you're honoring your veteran. That's how you do it. These headstones represent thousands of veterans and their stories. Perhaps the most notable at Jefferson Barracks is the story of Michael Blassie. On May 11, 1972, Blassie was killed by enemy fire while piloting his A-37B Dragonfly aircraft in South Vietnam. His body was not identified, so in 1982, his remains were placed in the tomb of the unknown soldier. But thanks to historians and DNA evidence, the St. Louis native's remains were finally identified, and in 1998, he was brought here to his final resting place at Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. Michael Blassie is just one of hundreds of thousands of Americans who served our country and did not return home. There are hundreds of thousands more American veterans alive today. And today is the day we honor all of them. We honor them for their sacrifice, their bravery, their commitment to our country. I'm Tim Gore. On behalf of HECTV, thank you to our nation's veterans. What it means to me to, to serve our country, I, I, I come from, like I said, a long line of veterans. And to me, it was an obligation that I had. It was something that I, that I had to do. And uh, since I'd been a small child, that's all I ever wanted to do, is I wanted to know that I had done my part to help us enjoy the lifestyle and uh, the livings that we have today. And I mean, that, that was the, I guess to me the biggest thing was to know that I was a part of that and uh, to have the honor to serve with some of the, the bravest men I've ever met in my life. It means that I had the chance to give back something that the country gives me. It means that I was able to stand next to the men and uh, do my part, where I, I didn't have to stand back. Because when I was younger, the men were always out front. Well, I got my chance to be out with them. That's what it meant to me. Well, what it means to me to be able to serve my country is uh, to be able to give to others. And as you see, what I'm still doing is still providing services for others. It is an honor. Uh, it is one that was bestowed on me uh, to be able to do that. And uh, I take that very seriously. Um, not only serving my country overseas and in foreign countries, but also at home. So I take that pride and I take that very seriously to be able to give back to what was given to me. I'm a service-oriented person. Um, that's what I've chosen my life to be about. It's about um, giving, giving more than you get. And I couldn't do anything else. I mean, this is who I am. To me, wearing that uniform meant the world. And uh, it still did even when I retired. Uh, I really had a hard time giving it up. It's hanging in the closet and I'll be buried in it. What did it mean to you to be able to serve your country at that period of time? I'm proud. <laughs>